world finally settles in. You may have been unprepared to go remote, and then you are suddenly turned into a remote-only company. Are we any closer to effective remote work and reconstructing a familiar workspace? Mark Kilby is going to outline key lessons from teams who have navigated change to survive and even thrive. For over 20 years, Mark has cultivated distributed teams across multiple industries. It's also rumored that Mark was a rocket scientist at one time. His easygoing style helps teams learn to collaborate and discover their paths to success. He shares his remote team experience in his latest book, From Chaos to Successful Distributed Agile Teams, Collaborate to Deliver. Hi, Mark. Hi, Andrea. How are you? <laughs> good, good, good. I'm glad to be here. Thank you so much for having me join the conference. It's been wonderful. Thank you for joining us. So before you start, Mark, I have a controversial question to, to, to make. So do you Wait, think- Is it the pizza question? It's not the pizza question. Oh, it's not darn. the pizza question. <laughs> but it, more or less. So do you think a hot dog is the sandwich? Ooh. This is a Ooh. tough question, Mark. Yeah. Uh, some would question, is it even meat? <laughs> uh, um, <laughs> I, I would say yes, because the sandwich has bread and something in between. Exactly. That is the, the same thought I have. It, you yeah. sandwich is a bread with something in it, right? Yeah. So, you may uh, not want what's in it, but it's in there. Yeah. It is it's there, exactly. Yeah. So go ahead, Mark. The stage is yours. Thank you. All right. Let me go ahead and share my screen. All right. So this, I, 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 I want to thank FutureWorks. I want to thank the sponsors. This has been an awesome conference. I have enjoyed watching the other presenters, uh, some that I know, some that I'm getting to know through, through this conference. And uh, usually having the last slot on the last day is not considered a great thing, but I've, I've, I've actually see it as a privilege because we have so much change that we're dealing with and so many ideas probably from this conference and possible change that you can make that hopefully this talk will kind of help you wrap it all up and, and come away with what will you do with this information? How will you move forward? So as Andrea said, I have worked with distributed teams for many years uh, and, and with distributed agile teams in particular for about 17 of those years. So I've worked with hybrid distributed teams. I've worked with distributed teams where just a few people were, were remote and for about six, seven years, work with completely distributed organizations. So I consult with them. I do training, both uh, private and public training. And uh, as Andrea said, and you see here on the screen, uh, wrote a book with my my wonderful co-author Johanna Rothman uh, that talked about what we learned with our, our years and years of experience in working with distributed agile teams. So with that, I'd like to tell you a little bit of a story of a team. So let's say, well, first of all, let me say this, we're, we're going to talk about this team. We're gonna talk about how this team handled change. We're gonna talk about how they might deal with too much change. And we're gonna talk about how they experimented with change. And I'll actually talk about a few teams in this. But let's, let's imagine this team that They've been working together for a while. They've had their ups and downs. And as Laurel was saying in her talk, um, they, they tracked their performance. And overall, they did well. This, this was their average way of working. So this was their status quo. And over time, a change was introduced. And we see these changes not only in the last few months, but we've, we've all experienced them in some way, shape, or form. So it could be a new process. It could be a new team member. 
It could be new infrastructure, new tools that were introduced, um, sometimes rapidly, as we've experienced in the last few months, uh, sometimes gradually, based on a more planful approach. Um, it could be a new conflict within the team. It could be a new conflict outside the team. We've seen that in, uh, especially here in the US, but now worldwide with some of the, um, the challenges around the, the diversity issues that are really coming to the surface now. But it could also be due to some failures. Uh, it could be um, an urgent change in a product direction or a service direction. It could be um, a tool or infrastructure failure. Somebody might become sick on the team and you, ha you have to adjust to that. Or it could be your leader is unavailable and you need that leader to address some of the changes and, and how the team could deal with it, but that person's not there to help you with that. So when we introduce the change, when we want to take on the change, we always have this expectation that we're going to be at a better place. The new status quo, going from the old to the new status quo is going to be a big improvement. That's why we're taking on the change. We want to improve things. But when change is imposed on us or happens to us from outside, as it has for many of us these last few months, we, we feel like things are going downhill. We have no control. And, and that's what it appears like. But really, under the right conditions, this is what change actually looks like for, for many individuals and teams. So this model uh, is, this change model is known by many names. Uh, sometimes it's referred to as the Satir change model. Sometimes it's referred to as the J curve because of the J shape. Sometimes it's referred to as the Kubler-Ross model. Uh, you may have heard one of these versions of it, but it's all with talks about how we deal with change. So in this model, when we have that change, the change is challenging our assumptions and we may end up at a better place once we learn to deal with the, the change or we may end up at roughly the same level of performance or we may be not as performant as we were before. This is where we go through a bit of a mind shift in our thinking. But rather than being abstract, let me smooth out the curve a little bit for you and talk about what are some of the steps we go through when we're dealing with change. So we know the status quo, we know about the change, and I've just mentioned that it challenges our assumptions. The next step for many of us is we have resistance to the change. We don't want our assumptions challenged and we wanna hold on to those assumptions. But after a while we realize those, those beliefs or assumptions are not helping us in this new way of working. I think with remote work, with everything we've talked about these last three days, we, we can all understand now that many of us have let go of that. I think Laurel said right now, 30% of the people um, that, that are now working remote want to stay working remote. And that's a big shift from the 3% it was before uh, COVID happened. So there was a little bit of unlearning. That's that next step. They, that you let go of those assumptions, but you're still struggling. And that's what this fifth step is. You're still struggling with the change. You're still trying to figure out, how do I make this work? It just feels like it's getting, it's just putting me further and further behind. My work is suffering. I know for me personally, uh, my work has suffered and I'm used to working distributed, but not being able to easily go work in a coffee shop or, um, go visit with colleagues or just to be able to move out of my house uh, has been constraining for me. 
and it's it's impeded my choice of how I prefer to work. That's where, as we go through the bottom of this trough here, we start to get some ideas. We we might get them from a conference like this. We might get them from something we read, something we heard, or something we accidentally stumbled across and say, hey, I think I can use this idea. I think I can do something with this. And you try and you try to try it out a little bit. And maybe there's a couple of ideas you go through over time. And eventually you start to integrate the new learning and you end up eventually at that new status quo, which as I said before, might be better. It might get you to the same level of performance. And for, for some of us that are gonna be remote for a while, you may not be as, as performant as you were. You may not be at that same level. And that's okay for a while until you come up with the next change uh, in understanding how you will work moving forward. So here's another important tip. We all move through this curve at a different rate. None of us, even if we're on the same team, even if we're a close knit team, we do not move through this at the same point. So that's very important to keep in mind. So let's check that. So uh, I, I will ask our hosts if they could go ahead and post this in the, the YouTube channel, which I happen to have on the side here, so I can see that. Uh, if you go to menti.com, so you can do this on your on your desktop, on a tablet, on a phone, um, enter this code and they'll have it for the chat in, in here. Oh, there it is. Thank you very much. And there'll be a little bit of a quiz asking you which of these stages are you in right now? Okay. And I'm going to leave the poll kind of running in the background and we'll check on it a little bit later. Okay. So, are you still kind of resisting the change? Are you starting to let go? Are you really at a turning point where you think you have, you've, you've gone through the worst, but you're ready to do something new, or maybe you've got those new ideas and maybe you've started integrating the new learning. So just pick one of those. All right, and I see some people starting to get in. Excellent. All right, so let me go back to the slides here. So we have these stages, each of us move through it differently, different groups move through it differently. But what happens when we deal with too much change? And I think we can all appreciate this over the last few months. So when we're at this lowest point, this is sometimes known as the point of chaos. You've, you've wrestled with the change, you're not sure if you'll if things will ever get better. You're at that very low point in your performance. But if you're a, a team leader or a manager, or you've you've got the let's say you're not a manager, but you've got the respect of others on your team, keep in mind the team collectively needs to go through this point. They need to wrestle with this. And this is part of the unlearning process. But it's, it's also important to help others try to find those transforming ideas. So sometimes this can be as simple as just listening. Where are you trying to find help? Um, how can I help? Sometimes just by asking some questions and like that and listening to the responses can help them think about where have they looked? Where have they not looked for answers? Once, once they feel that they've been heard and you're clear on what their challenge is, where they're wrestling with change, because as we all go through this curve, we might have different perceptions of that change. It's important that you listen carefully so that when you start providing suggestions on where to look for those transforming ideas, that you can give several options that help them in their particular their particular type of exploration of the change because if we have too much change 
And I've seen this with large transformations of organizations and even small team transformations where, <clears throat> excuse me, where they try to take on too much change. It's, it's too many assumptions challenged. It's too much for them to wrestle with. And it pushes their performance down and it takes them longer. So you see this curve getting pushed out more. And in some cases they wonder, are we ever going to recover? And most teams eventually will with the proper support and, and coaching, either through management or external uh, coaching, like uh, which I have done in the past. But you need to provide that environment. That's that right environment to help teams navigate that. So try to avoid big changes. And even um, I've heard that I heard this in Laurel's talk earlier. I heard this in the panel discussion earlier uh, in trying small things. I even heard this uh, earlier in the week from uh, the folks at Buffer and GitLab. Try, try to make those small changes. But then you get anxious and say, all right, we're in a period of real chaos. We, we need to make a lot of changes. And so there might be temptation to drop those changes in as fast as you can, but maybe your team is not ready to take on those changes. They still have to go through that, that, that period of resistance and unlearning before they're ready to take on new ideas. And if they don't have that time and you drop another change on them, maybe uh, a new tool for collaboration, and then some new policies. The, the team kind of keeps going down and down. And in those cases, they may never recover. They may be in real trouble. So my tip for you in, in that case is slow down where you can. Make sure you check in with everyone so you know where are they with the changes right now? Where are they on that change curve? And are they getting the help they need to kind of navigate through that? This is what helps the team stay on track and work together to get over those bumps that they're dealing with right now. Because if you go too fast to that, you kind of fall off track as this picture would imply. So let's talk about experimenting through change. So one of the best ways I've found to help navigate that chaos is as, as the team has, has gone through the unlearning phase and they're, they're dealing with the, the chaos and they're, they're ready to start exploring ideas, pick one thing, one or two things maybe that you can easily change. So uh, we saw this in, in several of the other presentations, what were small steps that these teams took? So giving the, the team some choice in what they change and, and making it small changes. So what is their hypothesis around, around the change? What will help improve? And how will you measure this? Is it performance? Is it something else? Is it some employee satisfaction rating uh, or, or something else you might measure to see, is this change effective? And what is the experiment we're, we're going to run? And set a time limit or a time box around that. Don't run this experiment forever. And if you're dealing with lots of chaos, it's important that you keep very short experiments. So for those teams, before COVID that were shifting to remote by choice, they might run experiments every week. So those time boxes might be a week long, maybe a few days long, depending on what the small change was. In times, in this time of, of rapid change, you might want to take very small changes and do a experiment of a day or two, but make sure you're getting everybody to pay attention to what is it we're measuring? What is it we, we need to pay attention to? And maybe you have to stop the experiment early even. So it's important to pay attention to what is it we're measuring and are we measuring the right results? 
and then taking time to, to say, what are we learning from this? And this doesn't necessarily take a long time. So with some of my teams, I, well, actually I had one team in particular that went remote about four years ago and they deal with many different products at once. And because of that, they deal with many changes all the time. And so what they did is they, they, um, they had uh, Slack in this case, they had their team channel in Slack, but they had a separate channel to talk about changes because they didn't want to lose track of that. So they would briefly note, hey, there was this thing happened, we should probably talk about it. And then once a week, they would spend a little time talking about the changes. And if any conversation took more than five minutes to resolve, that was a cue for them to have a longer conversation. So every week they do this check-in on what did they what did they wrestle with? What did they have problems with? And was there a quick fix or did they need to set, a, set up an experiment around this? And this was a very good way for them to go through all the different changes that they were dealing with. You might wanna even add a little formality to this, especially if it's a longer experiment. So if you're going to uh, a week or two weeks, maybe a month for a longer change, um, like going back into the office and what will that look like? So what would be your hypothesis around that? What would be some of the risks? What are some of the downside risks? What are some of the upside risks if we were, for instance, going, going back into the office or staying remote or a mix of things? So be explicit on what everyone feels is the downside and the upside. Who is involved? So who's directly impacted? Usually your team but there might be others. Uh, there's certainly stakeholders involved as well. So there might be uh, different managers, there might be customers, there might be uh, other parts of your organization that are impacted by that, that probably need to know something about this experiment. They might even be part of the experiment. What are some of the assumptions? And uh, are these, do these need to be validated in some way? These might be some of the assumptions that end up getting challenged by the initial change. And what are some dependencies we have around this? And then what is the experiment? Or maybe there's a couple of related experiments in this. I would still keep the number small. Don't do too many at once. Um, for most of my teams during any week, they will probably do anywhere from one to three experiments and be very explicit who's the owner. In other words, who's paying attention to those results? It may not be the whole team. So at least have one person paying attention so that they can bring it back to the team and bring it back to your stakeholders and influencers. And then finally, what are the insights that we learn? So after, after we've gone through these experiments, and we validated or realized the assumptions are invalid, what do we take from this? Is there something we wanna continue doing? Is there something we wanna do a little bit differently? Or do we realize the experiment didn't work at all? We need to do something completely different to deal with this latest change, okay? So remember, if you're bringing the change to the team, you might see this. And this is might be what the team sees. So another tip is make sure you include your team, whoever's impacted by the experiment, make sure you discuss what the experiment is with them. So experiment with them, not on them. I have found in my 20 plus years, no one likes to be a lab rat. Nobody wants to have uh, a lack of control over the experiments. They don't want to be experimented on at all. So let's check on our experiment. Let's see where everybody is. So let me go back to the slides here or the poll. All right. 
If you didn't get a chance to to uh, enter the poll, go ahead. You can do it now. But as I said, there's some people that are still feeling like their assumptions are challenged. They're unlearning. Uh, some are still feeling in that period of chaos. S several people have found some of those transforming ideas. And some have taken a little bit further and have figured out where to go next. We've certainly heard that from our speakers this week, but nobody's figured it all out yet. And I would agree with that. I would not even say I have figured it all out yet. Uh, I've heard many of our speakers today or this week say they have not all figured it out yet from this, this pandemic and what we've all experienced. I think it's gonna take us all quite a bit of time to assess that. So this is, a, this is a useful kind of check to do with your team by showing them, you know, explaining this model to them and checking in with where they are. What phase are, are they in right now? All right, back to the slides real quick. So, one last thing, because I always get this question in almost every talk I've done on remote teams is people ask me about my favorite online tools. And not only now, but any time I work with remote teams, my favorite tools are patience, empathy, and listening. This is what's going to allow your teams to always navigate that change. Keep that model in mind, use these tools, and you will be able to help yourself and your teams navigate that change. So we've talked about how to handle that change. We've talked about uh, what to do when there's too much change and how you might slow it down a little bit. Experimenting is the best way to do that. And make sure you include those who are impacted by the experiment to, to help form the experiment, to help develop the experiment. So with that, I decided to end a little bit early because it's been a long week for all of us. And uh, I don't mind ending any meeting early. I've never had a complaint with that. Uh, if you'd like a worksheet to help your teams navigate change, go ahead and uh, grab that URL there. And uh, let's take some questions. Thank you so much, Mark. Um, so I have the first question here. So since we are all working distributed and we are absorbing this new methodology, Will the stigma, stigma of having challenges managing a remote team going to disappear? So I, I, I question methodology because as I said in the talk, we still haven't figured it all out. Certainly um, in, our, in our book uh, that Johanna Rothman and I wrote, we, we give some guidance, we give some principles, we give some practices, but there's so many ways still to uh, have a successful remote team. There's also many ways to have very unsuccessful remote teams. And that's mostly what we experience because we're taking on too much change at once. Um, now about the stigma part of it, uh, I, I think my opinion is, and I had this at the beginning of the pandemic and I think it's still gonna be the case. I, I think, it's going to be a little more polarizing for people uh, on do we stay remote or not. Uh, the, we're far, far from done with the pandemic. I, I think many of us realize that. There's many changes we would have to make to go back into the office. And as Laurel said in her talk just before, you know, 30% of us, about a third of us want to stay remote who've never work remote before. I know I actually prefer to work remote. I get to be with my family. They're literally on the other side of my door over there. Uh, I, I, and I have just as much ability as I do, uh, as I did previously to collaborate with colleagues all over the world now. 
And I think with where our technology is, but also with where some of our understanding is of how we can work online, we can be successful. So I don't think there's so much a stigma, but I think there will be some strong, stronger arguments for and against. And I, I think it's probably going to be at least another year or so before we come to some new normal around remote work. Right. Can we measure the influence of the pandemic and the mind shift we're seeing? Yeah. Yes, the, the, if I were to draw that curve, it would go way down and way out. <laughs> so I couldn't fit it on the screen for, for many of us. Um, and you know, some, some, some people did experiment very quickly with many different tools, many different approaches. Um, what, what was um, really just uplifting was how I was seeing different groups of people try to help each other. So those who had started experimenting rem remote, how there were communities helping each other in different ways. I mean, now it's, there's, there, there's training and, and coaching available now, but um, it did help shorten the curve for some. It did help shrink the curve for some. And, and that's, my, that's my point of being empathetic and listening as you're still going through some changes and there's more to come as we think about, do we go back in the office or not? Be empathetic, be willing to listen to others and how you might help them with the changes they're going to go through in the coming months. So how can we slow down when external forces ask us to speed up? For example, we mustn't lose productivity when introducing remote work. So, so there's, there's nothing wrong with talking about productivity, but what I usually do is I, I have shown this same model to executives and say, and actually I think, yeah, I think Laurel did mention in her talk where she talked about productivity will go down. This, this is a model that's been proven many times in, in actually many different disciplines. Uh, we, we all wrestle with change initially because it, it disrupts our normal way of thinking. And going faster doesn't help. It just, it just slams us into the resistance phase even harder and faster. Um, so... So what's important is to, to educate some, some of the outside forces that are pushing uh, to go faster to say, okay, we need to help people make this change. Now, some of those outside forces we have no control over. Um, and in those cases, how, how can you minimize those impacts? Now, certainly we couldn't minimize the impact of, of everyone having to get kicked out of the office in March. Uh, but how could, how did you support people in learning the new tools? How did you support people in just connecting? So I saw many people that would just have some of those one-to-one -one conversations. Uh, Pilar Ortiz was talking about the virtual coffee chats in her talk uh, as just a way of, of uh, rebuilding trust or building trust and uh, I, I think her, her talk on trust was spot on. Whenever you have a massive change like this that you don't have a lot of control, probably one of the most important things to experiment with is, okay, how can we rebuild trust that together we can, we can work through this change? Do you think beside trust and external um, everything right, that we can't, um, we can't, do nothing. Uh, do you have any advice to help people that are in resistance phase? So all of us, all of us need our own time to work through resistance. And that's where the listening is, is helpful. As, as part of this, as the listener, you, you need to get a sense of how open are they to something different? How open are they to solving the problem? So if you can provide 
at least three options to show them a way forward. Don't try to convince them there's only one path because there rarely is. There's options. Um, and I, I learned this uh, very well from my co-author, Johanna Rothman and, and some other folks. Giving at least those three options gets them thinking about other options and gets it kind of helps loosen that resistance a bit. They start realizing, okay, maybe I do have some control. Maybe I do have some choice. That was the biggest difference between uh, pre-pandemic and post-pandemic. Pre-pandemic, uh, many of the teams that were working fully remote had the choice. They, they went that way by choice, and so they were willing to experiment. Those post-pandemic, they got slammed into this, and so there was a lot of resistance, and, and that's okay. That's natural. Uh, but if we can present some options on how to move forward, or we can at least talk about what are three options that can help us, that starts to loosen the resistance. And it's, and it's not about going one specific way. It's about you and your team discussing, okay, what are some ways that we can go together? What are, what are we comfortable with? And that's what can help. Uh, how can you benchmark your new learnings while the pandemic is still here? Hmm. So uh, along with the experiments and what you're measuring in the experiments, those might be temporary measures, but you, you might look at some sort of longer term team performance measure. So for instance, um, as soon as the team is given some work uh, or there's an idea of, of a new type of work, because we still all have work to do, and when they actually get it to the customer, not when it's done within the organization, but when it actually gets to the customer, that's, that's one measure. And does that time get shorter? Does it get longer? Another one that I would recommend is feedback. So if, if you've got this time from, from idea or request from the customer to delivery, how long does it take for you to get feedback from the customer? Because they're dealing with this pandemic too. Is there something you can help them with? Is there a way you can make it easier for, for them to uh, find your product, to learn how to use your product, and, and to have the product make it their day easier in some very difficult days? So those are two measures I would look at. So the survey I did in Menti, that was one very simple uh, feedback mechanism from the beginning of the talk to the end of the talk. So in a 25, 30 minute span, I got a little feedback on, you know, who, who was willing to be vocal about this, who felt enough psychological safety that they could vote on that. I don't know how many are on right now, but with the small number would tell me there's probably still some people that are distracted. There are some people that are still wrestling with this and they're not sure where they're at and they might need somebody to help them talk about where they are and what options they have to move forward. Right. How much time do you think we will need to get to the new status quo? Will we be able to understand it before the whole pandemic situation is controlled? Mm. So, so if we're talking globally, I, I think that's well into next year, but as, as with, any change we have early adopters and experimenters we have the 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 main group and the late adopters so we heard from the panel this morning there there were some some early adopters uh certainly folks like buffer and and gitlab very early adopters in in remote work so they they can do very they can navigate the change curve very quickly. They've got mechanisms in place. They have habits in place. They have a way to get their people involved in experimenting quickly around something. Uh, for those who don't have those mechanisms, though, it's going to take them longer until they develop that or they get help developing that. I don't care whether it's me, if it's Laurel, if it's Pilar, you know, one of the speakers here, uh, if you are in one of those longer stretches and, and you're not seeing a way out, you're at the bottom of that curve. 
get some help, bring in some help, at least to get some different perspective to help you generate what are some options, what are some transforming ideas to help you move forward and get back to some sort of status quo that you and your teams can be happy with. How important is the team um, when navigating changes? Is it only dependent on the individual alone or you should take the time the team has been together? Uh, yes, <laughs> it's, the, it's the general answer. Um, so so I'll, I'll say this because I, 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 I know from following some of these speakers and, and talking to them as well, uh, many of them recommend one-on-one -on -one conversations. I, I fully endorse that. Whenever I start working with a new team, I try to do one-on-ones. As I'm working over extended period of time with team members uh, or with the team, I try to do one-on-ones with the, the team members in some sort of regular cadence, just so I can get a sense of where everybody is individually. Where are you with the current experiments? Where are you with the, the organization and how it supports experimentation? And then when we go into conversations as a team, on what is the next change that we need to either handle as a team and experiment through, or what is the next change that we want to introduce to try to get to a better status quo. Having the, the, the context of knowing that some of the individual perspectives, uh, trying to find some psychologically safe ways to bring those out into the open for the whole team to think about and then have the team craft experiments to move forward. That's what counts. So having both an individual perspective and a team perspective, that sounds like a long process, but as a team learns to work together, as they understand this particular model and learn to work with it, it can actually, as I talked about the one team that was dealing with many changes, they can do this literally within 15 minutes with a few different changes. So that's, that's what I've seen. Once you get accustomed to it, you can go, you can go faster and faster through these changes. Thank you so much, Mark, for your insights.